Is it possible for an Orthodox Jewish woman to run a world-renowned fashion company or be a four-time Emmy-winning producer on one of the most celebrated morning shows of all time? Is it possible for an Orthodox Jewish man to be the director of a hit Disney kids show or the dean of one of the top law schools in America? Hi, I'm Allison Josephs, also known as Jew in the City. Since 2012, Jew in the City has brought you the Orthodox Jewish All-Stars, 10 individuals who have made history or reached the tops of their professional fields, all while keeping Shabbos, kosher, and staying committed to their Jewish heritage. Our All-Stars don't just defy stereotypes. They've motivated people of all backgrounds to strengthen their commitment to their Jewish heritage while remembering to dream big. But in the wake of rising anti-Semitism around the world, this year's Orthodox Jewish All-Stars don't just shatter misconceptions. We share their stories with you as a reminder that we should never cower in fear, but always be proud of who we are and what we practice. I grew up in New York City. I went to Ramaz for lower in high school, and I spent a year in Israel at Midrashat Lindenbaum, which was called Bravinders at the time. I've been very fortunate working at the Today Show that I've gotten to meet so many people from politicians to celebrities to newsmakers. People are curious, there's a natural curiosity. You know, what do you mean you sit under a hut and you eat outside, that sounds really cool. So Passover, you're only eating matzah or can you eat other things? During the O.J. Simpson trial, I was faced with a challenge when my senior producer said, we're gonna need you to stake out attorney Barry Sheck's office and make sure you can book him. And I said, today is Yom Kippur Eve, I have to, be home. I have to get home by a certain time. She said, I promise you, go down, do this during the afternoon, and if it comes to where this is insane and there are a million cameras and you need some relief, we'll, we'll send someone. There was always a respect of my traditions and there was a mutual respect because, you know what, if they needed me after Yom Kippur, I would come in that Sunday or whenever, whenever it is. My boss called me and left a message. Okay, Federbush, I see there are three stars out, so I'm gonna need you to come in and help out on this one. And he knows that I, you know, that I would and did. But I'm sort of proud that I was one of the people who essentially formulated the careful mathematics behind atomic and molecular physics. There's something called continuous symmetry breaking. The Higgs boson is an example of continuous symmetry breaking and the only example where it's been mathematically proven to occur is a result that I proved with two other people 30 years ago now and there are no other results along that line it's just hard my parents were not observant at all but they did have Jewish identity I was bar mitzvahed in a reform synagogue and in graduate school I was introduced to uh, from Kite and uh, it really appealed to me for a variety of reasons. You know, I'm a mathematician, and mathematicians are well known to be eccentric. So I have a different kind of eccentricity from other people. Science doesn't give answers, it asks questions. Um, and it's certainly not all questions, and not all things are answered. I was at a lecture where someone, this was 15 years ago, they had just decoded the first genetic full genome, and there was someone, it was in a virus, and someone was explaining that there were 140 genes, they understood all of them. A very distinguished theoretical physicist was sitting next to me. Without thinking about who he was talking to, he leaned over and said, it's hard to believe something like that arose spontaneously, isn't it? And I said, precisely, and he got very red. My grandma would get everyone together. She was really the matriarch of our family and she would have a beautiful Shabbat dinner and my grandpa would make Kiddush and my aunts and uncles were there, all my cousins. And it was a time for family. And um, when we left Paris and made the journey to the United States, we kept those traditions with us. So I think in life, when we go through um, turmoil or when we go through hard times, we look for the pillars in our life that have brought us consistency. And in my life, um, a sense, an overwhelming sense of consistency was always the Kiddush on Friday night, was always the lighting of the candles. I had tried so many things, I think I was so open to everything, open to this Indian healing lady and open to meditation and open to group therapy or therapy one-on-one -on -one. and I had done so many things and nothing quite filled that void. When the time was right and I did approach a rabbi, every 
ailment I had had cure in Torah, and I had tried everybody else's path, so it was time that I followed my roots and tried mine. I started to work for my family business. First, like as an apprentice, as an intern in every department, in every division, my dad said to me, you know, we're starting this brand, and um, I'm not quite sure about the direction, and I'm, I, I'd really like your opinion on it. So I came into the office, I took a look, and I love the name instantly, BCBG Generation. It felt to me like the next generation of BCBG shoppers. So um, I came to look at the line, and I said to him, um, you know, I would try this, and I would try that, and I think that this might be off-brand. And um, that afternoon, we were, I, I followed him into a meeting, and he introduced me as the creative director. I was like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> Even when I travel for a business trip and I have to tell somebody, oh, you know, sorry, I can host you in a kosher restaurant, but I can't go to that restaurant, you know, they automatically start to ask questions or they'll comment that my hair was short last week, but it's long this week. How did that work? The true entrepreneurs, the true leaders, they all have that quality in common and they have this sense of respect for people that really hold to their values. You know, I'm so proud of who I am. I'm proud to cover my hair. I'm proud to be keeping Shabbat. I'm proud to be, you know, raising my children in an Orthodox life. And so as long as it doesn't bother someone else, you know, those walls are broken as soon as anybody will let me in. So I was on our faculty for six years and uh, our dean at the time was David Lebron, a wonderful dean who'd helped to hire me. But he announced that he was leaving, and so a friend came to me and said, do you want to be dean? And I said, you mean someday? Uh, and I'd been on the faculty for only six years. I was 35 years old at the time. Um, but it ended up that I became our dean that year. I was the youngest dean in Columbia Law School's history of now over 150 years. And I'm also the young, I was the youngest dean of any law school that I knew of during the 10 years that I served as dean. Judaism was very important to my family. Uh, I went to a Jewish day school, which was a wonderful experience, something we certainly have wanted for our children. Um, my parents were traditional conservative, and so that was the way I was raised. Uh, and I became more serious about Judaism later uh, when I met my girlfriend, then fiance, then wife. Uh, Meredith is the granddaughter of an Orthodox rabbi, and actually many people in her family, the, the couples tend to be women who were Orthodox, men who hadn't been, uh, so I guess I was part of a tradition there. So I think it's fair to say the Orthodox community is diverse, maybe more diverse than some people who aren't close to it realize, and so uh, I do think there have been times when people have known me for a while, but it never came up uh, that I am Orthodox. Uh, as soon as we eat together, it becomes clear because what I eat will depend on where we are and what kind of food it is. But um, I do think overall people have been very supportive and sympathetic and I think in some cases interested. So why do you do what you do? What does it involve? That kind of thing. I do think that when we're in a holiday season, we're, we're all extremely busy before and after the holiday because the amount of work that you have to get done doesn't change, but you have less time to, to do it, which means uh, be efficient and, and unfortunately sleep less sometimes. Uh, but I do think it's important for people not to think that someone who's religiously observant isn't going to be doing the same amount of work. And uh, our secret weapon, of course, is that there are holidays where we're very happy to contribute at work when others uh, do not want to work. You know, since I was six, seven years old, I did something that all kids do. I drew. I drew all the time. And then I was in high school, I see a movie that changes my life. I saw the movie The Little Mermaid, and I said, Mom, that's what I want to do. I want to be a Disney animator. It was very competitive. Everybody in animation wanted to work at Disney. I said, you know what, whatever happens, I'm never going to give up. I sent a portfolio into Disney my sophomore year. I got rejected. I wasn't discouraged. I was like, you know what, fuel for the fire, let's keep going. I tried again my junior year. This time they picked 17 from around the world. Over 35 applications, I made it to number 20. I missed it by three. So close, more fuel for the fire. I tried again. I sent a portfolio the third time and I got a call back. Saul, we've accepted you. I couldn't believe it. My dream came true. The first Disney movie that I directed was a Winnie the Pooh movie. And the very first day on the film, I had to look at the 100 acre wood on a huge layout drawing. And I looked at Winnie the Pooh's house and it looked like it was missing something. 
I sharpened my pencil, and right by Pooh's doorway, I hid a mezuzah. <laughs> and so it's actually Winnie the Jew when you watch the movie. You know, Disney artists like to hide things in there. I hid a mezuzah in Winnie the Pooh's house on the door. <laughs> Many years ago, I had just finished animating on a film called Mulan, and we found out we were gonna work on Tarzan, but the movie Tarzan wasn't ready for us animators to go on to. They were still fixing the script. So I had what's called downtime. Downtime at Disney World is you get paid to do nothing. I always tell people, if they ever offer you a job with downtime, you take the job. And you know what downtime is at Disney World? Space Mountain, Splash Mountain, Thunder Mountain. I became quite the mountaineer. And I'm crashing Disney hotels with my friends. There's this one beautiful hotel. It has a current swimming pool. I'm floating on my back. And everything I want in my life I have, whatever the checklist is I have, I have a great girlfriend who I now married. I have a paycheck, sports car, beautiful apartment, everything I ever could have wanted, but something was missing. And as I was floating on my back there, and I said, you know what, I'm going to Israel. My friends are like, what are you going to Israel for? I said, because I want to find out how I fit into the Jewish people. You see, Orthodox Judaism, Torah, I infuse it into my life and it provides a springboard for me to enhance my life and infuse meaning in everything that I do. Oh my God, you've never tasted a cheeseburger, ever? Not even once? You haven't tried even a little bit? It's like, no, it's not allowed. Like, no, haven't done it. So I bring my bagel and cream cheese with me and I'm sitting at the table and they bring out a metal bowl. I'm in South Korea and out of the metal bowl shoots tentacles of an octopus that is alive. The challenge for me usually is when I'm traveling in Asia and what I tend to do then is to smuggle a can of corn or green beans into my suitcase. But every now and again, I start wondering whether I will be arrested for smuggling food into a country. And the tentacles shoot out on the table and the bowl is moving around on the table. And I see them with their chopsticks take the octopus and wrap it around, open their mouth, and they take a bite of a live octopus. At that moment, I am so grateful I'm a kosher Orthodox Jew. And at the fanciest hotel in Las Vegas, Microsoft was having a cocktail party for press. And someone there knew and said, we'll have kosher food for you. Somebody comes over and they have this plate, they have a regular plate with a slice of salami. I have no reason to believe it was kosher salami next to a piece of cheese. So I was very polite and then I quickly put the plate down and you know, there are fortunately lots of good kosher restaurants in Las Vegas. I had all these editors for a beautiful dinner actually hosted in a non-kosher restaurant, a very, very happening non-kosher restaurant. And I said to myself, okay, just bring me my kosher food in. So I'll have it plated by the restaurant and I'll have one of my assistants bring it in, make sure the plates kind of look similar. We got the food to kind of match. You know, it was like we had sandwiches, they had sandwiches, that kind of a vibe. And, um, the editor sitting next to my husband became so friendly with us and she was reaching into our food and taking from our food and mixing <laughs> My husband and I are like, no! So I think some people think that I eat much more healthily than I do because occasionally I'll be eating an apple when they're eating a steak. And I do like steak, but it has to be a kosher steak. I mean, kosher funny stories, there's, a, there's like, I can think of a million. I work hard. Monday to Friday, I work hard. I got the iPhone, the iPad, I'm always connected. Tons of emails coming in from producers and projects and writers and animators. But Friday comes, ah, oh, it's the best. I leave work, iPhone off, iPad off, I come home, get ready for Shabbat. My kids are dressed beautifully, my wife's made an incredible dinner. And I know that Friday night, Daddy is home. Not just home on the iPhone, but home. That's what balances me as a Jew. And that's what balances me as a filmmaker. And they know that I'm not taking advantage of the situation that I'm leaving for Shabbat. They know that, wow, when Blinkoff's here, he works 110%. And if he's not here, it's because he can't be. In my life, because I manage a home and children and a husband and, and, and my business, for me, um, being able to walk away on Shabbat and shut everything off, it gives me such an incredible balance that when I'm in my business, I can be so fully there because I have no guilt, no no nothing, I, I come in with a lot of strength, a lot of positivity, and a lot of energy from the other parts of my life that are fueled. So there was a period of time early in my career when I wasn't Shabbos observant. And I really think it's one of the best things that ever happened to me, truthfully, because I think there is enormous wisdom in the idea of compelling yourself to make one day a week different.
It's important for me to have complete balance in my life. I have a family, I have three children, I have a very fulfilling career, and the spiritual part of my life is also equally as important. I'd be on a treadmill, you know, constantly if I didn't have, you know, days to reflect, days days off to be with my family. It's a good thing that they're shop is because otherwise we couldn't keep up with Barry Simon. And my response is he had it completely wrong because I recharge my batteries on Shabbos. I'm as productive as I am because I have Shabbos to put in touch with other parts of the world and other parts of my being. And uh, for me, that's a day that is very connected to family. And for those of us who are very busy six days a week, having that is so crucially important. Uh, but I do think for me, it's been enormously positive. Uh, and I really do believe in it. I have Shabbat, I have that time to take a, a break and take a time to reflect on what I'm going to create the next week. I couldn't live without it. And Shabbos is not a defect, it's a tremendous benefit. I really buy this argument that isn't that the Jews have kept Shabbos, it's that Shabbos kept the Jews.